There was a tweet thread that did the rounds a while ago uh, from a journalist, and I won't name them because they've gotten a lot of crap for it already, but uh, the journalist was saying that uh, when they offer YouTubers interviews in the press, they were particularly surprised by how many of the YouTubers asked to be compensated monetarily for their time. And the journalist and a lot of other people in their mentions on Twitter were saying, that's a ridiculous idea, people don't get paid for interviews, it's you supposed to do it for the press. Uh, and then some other people were saying, actually no, you know, if YouTubers don't really need to come to you to access an audience because they've got an audience of their own and you're taking up their time, then it is fair for them to ask to be compensated. And some people, this is where I'm particularly interested, said that YouTubers have been trained to monetize every interaction. The stereotypical image of the often female, teenage, narcissistic, vain, vapid YouTuber was doing a lot of the lifting in the surrounding discourse, like, oh, these entitled millennials with their selfie sticks and their hair and their labour theory of value. But what I was interested in was this idea that YouTube shapes a certain kind of person, builds a certain kind of self, and I'm in two minds about it. On the one hand, it seems kind of obvious to say, yeah, people will be affected by their environments. The, the kind of selves that people become will depend on what works for them. And if they learn that a kind of behavior works in one environment, why would they not try to apply it to other situations? Like if you learn on YouTube that your time is valuable and that you can be paid for it, why would you not like also ask a journalist for money? Foucault talks about the power, specifically the power of governments, shaping the kinds of selves that benefit them. So he talks about uh, the citizen as consumer, the citizen as complainer, but never rebel, the citizen as voter, but never disruptive activist, the citizen as critical of the political system and the people in it, but never as transformative revolutionary. In other words, he talks about the self of the citizen being grounded in submission to the power that made it. Foucault also talks about homo economicus, economic man being an entrepreneur of himself. Think about how we are encouraged to do things for the line on the CV, or how we are reasonably accustomed to the idea that you would do some work for the exposure, i.e. do unpaid work, or we're told to think about how our social media profiles might look to prospective future employers. We're encouraged to invest in our skill sets and know how to market ourselves. I mean, people sometimes deride sex workers as selling themselves, but really, we're all selling ourselves. That sounded like just the most... <laughs> the way I said that sounded like the most horrible, like, Philosophy 101 wanker. Like, if you think about it, like, we're all selling ourselves, man. But in a, in a way, like, it's true. And this idea of being an entrepreneur of oneself can seem like it's obvious and a given, and yeah, of course we do that, but that's just contingent on the society in which we live. It's not like that everywhere, and certainly throughout history it has not been like that across all times. So on the one hand, it seems obvious. Yeah, of course the self will be shaped by the conditions in which it lives, and if the conditions are YouTube, why would YouTube also not create a certain kind of self? The YouTuber. The YouTuber's soul, if you like. But on the other hand, I'm worried about reifying YouTube, of making it into something that is fixed and immovable and independent from what we, the creators and the people who participate in, that's you too, make it. The writer Evgeny Morozov, in his book Click Here to Save Everything, thinks that we make a big mistake when we talk about internet, because we tend to reify it as capital I, the internet, and what he says about the internet generally would apply to YouTube specifically. Morozov compares the way people talk about the internet with capital I to the way people used to talk about the printing press. And there was a landmark book in 1979 by Elizabeth Eisenstein called The Printing Press as an Agent of Change, I have it written down just there, in which Eisenstein argues that the printing press brought in something called print culture. That because the printing press, when it was invented, allowed accurate and rapid dissemination of texts, that somehow revolutionized the world. It revolutionized the way people talk about themselves and culture and everything, and it totally changed everything forever. And Morozov says, people used to talk about the printing press that way, and they talk about the internet that way now. But Eisenstein was wrong. Morozov says that she commits what he calls vulgar McLuhanism by attributing the effects the printing press had to the printing press itself. 
She says that the printing press had all of these effects because of what the printing press was, rather than saying, actually, the printing press had these effects because of the way people interact with it and the way people used it. She says that technology shaped society, rather than society shaping technology, or them shaping each other in a kind of feedback loop, I guess. For instance, you could get pretty accurate copying by hand before the printing press was invented, and there was already some dissemination of texts. Nobody's saying the printing press didn't have any effects at all, but the idea that it was A, a complete unit that just came and was total break with everything that came before, and then that unit was somehow special and totally changed society, it's just not a very accurate way of thinking about the effects that it had. It's not very good history. It overlooks all of the societal and historical and political factors that shaped the impact that the printing press had. And I'm probably guilty of this kind of vulgar McLuhanism as well, no doubt in this very series sometimes. So does YouTube shape the self? Or do ourselves shape YouTube? I honestly don't know the answer to this question. Uh, I, I I really don't know. Maybe, do I, do I even have to choose? Can it be both? I'm not sure. Maybe some hint, though, can come from the work of Anthony D'Angelo, whose videos have greatly inspired this series. Angelo recommends looking at a YouTube channel not as the documenting of a self, or an expression of some internal being, but as a work of art, as a work of literature, as a text, in other words. That way, we'd be able to say that YouTubers ourselves are shaped by the times and the conditions in which we work, but that the works we produce, not the selves we are, but the works that we produce, shape YouTube and affect what it means. I'm sorry that I don't have a definite conclusion or really much of a through line in this episode. I'm just, I came across all these ideas and I think they're really cool. I'm just kind of putting them out there to see what you can do with them. What do you think? What is the relationship between YouTube and YouTubers, the selves? Is there such a thing? Patreon.com slash PhilosophyTube is what helps me keep making the show and affording rent. Please sign up to give whatever you can. Alternatively, PayPal.me slash PhilosophyTube is where you can make a one-time donation.